Racecraft by Barbara J. Fields and Karen Fields, Chapter 5, Origins of the New South and the Negro Question. Race relations, a political formula devised at the end of the 19th century, is close kin to the race racism maneuver. Both divert the mind's eye from the shell that hides the pea. The race racism maneuver transforms racist action, invidious treatment, into race, inborn difference. In a cognate maneuver, the formula race relations drew a sentimental curtain of Old South symbols across the New South's class relations and politics. While the curtain concealed the South's cheap labor, black and white, it also muffled the noise of anti-democratic struggles to build white supremacy. To understand that double mission of white supremacy to hold down black people and white people alike, there exists no better source than Origins of the New South by the great American historian C. Van Woodward. Not the least remarkable fact about C. Van Woodward's Origins of the New South is that 50 years ago, Woodward knew better than to attempt what I have been asked to do. To discuss Afro-Americans as a subject apart from the subjects of land, agriculture, and rural unrest, industrial development and political economy, class warfare, class alliances, and politics, and literature, the sciences, and the arts. Then, as now, the more usual procedure was to relegate Afro-Americans to a space of their own, defined as race relations and set apart from the study of history properly so-called. Woodward never fell into that trap. He understood that the importance of Jim Crow as a subject in no way established its validity as a method. Never at any point in Origins is Woodward unaware of Afro-Americans' entire implication within the vital questions of the New South. Mean meaningless definitions of their predicament that may pass muster today, such as marginalization and exclusion, did not fool him for a minute. Marginalized, excluded, when the planters wanted nothing better than for them to stay conspicuously in their place working as before? The opening sentence of chapter one sets the tone at once, and with as fine an example as I know of Woodward's flair for mischief. Right there, where no one can miss it, he writes, any honest genealogy of the ruling family of Southern Democrats would reveal a strain of mixed blood. The mixture in question was of Whig and Democrat, rather than of black and white. But beyond doubt, the metaphor was calculated, trifling with the hallowed conventions of racism by thus juxtaposing the sacred and the profane, ruling class genealogy and mixed blood. Woodward serves early notice that, in method as in content, origins of the New South will neither fear nor respect the color line. Though he may flirt occasionally with the language of race relations, he only rarely makes concessions to its conceptual apparatus. Race relations, as an analysis of society, takes for granted that race is a valid empirical datum and thereby shifts attention from the actions that constitute racism. Enslavement, disenfranchisement, segregation, lynching, massacres, and pogroms to the traits that constitute race. For racists in the New South, those traits might have included the Negro's ignorance, laziness, brutality, criminality, subjection to uncontrolled passions, or incapacity for the moral and intellectual duties of civilization. For scholars in our own time who accept race, once ritually purified by the incantation socially constructed as a valid category of analysis, the relevant traits are more likely to be difference, otherness, culture, or identity. Either way, however, objective acts, the real substance of racism, take second place to subjective traits, the fictive substance of race. Traits that would be irrelevant to explaining racist acts, even if their empirical validity could be established. Quincy Ewing, a white southerner writing in the Atlantic Monthly while Woodward was an infant, refuted on empirical grounds the various racial explanations of the problem the Negroes purported ignorance, laziness, criminality, and the like. But such rationales, he maintained, were beside the point in any case. The problem would persist even were there no shadow of excuse for the conviction that the black man is more lazy or more ignorant or more criminal or more brutal 
or more anything else he ought not to be, or less anything else he ought to be, than other men. Not, according to Ewing, could the problem be laid to difference, an old favorite that has returned to favor, often graced with a capital D. There is nothing in the unlikeliness of the unlike that is necessarily problematical. He pointed out, it may be simply accepted and dealt with as a fact, like any other fact. Like or unlike, Ewing declared, no race, no, no race problem arises unless the people of one race are minded to adopt and act upon some policy more or less oppressive or repressive in dealing with the people of another race. He concluded, the problem, how to maintain the institution of chattel slavery, ceased to be at apomatics. The problem, how to maintain the social, industrial, and civic inferiority of the descendants of chattel slaves, succeeded it and is the race problem of the South at the present time. There is no other. Woodward is more attentive than Ewing to how white people differed among themselves in social and economic standing, objectives and aspirations, and ability to mobilize political power. But like Ewing, he recognizes that the essence of the situation was power and the contest over it, not just the contest, grotesquely unequal as it was, between white and Afro-American people, but also that among white people themselves. If allowed the rights of citizenship, Afro-Americans potentially held in their own hands the balance of power between contending groups of white people. If stripped of the rights of citizenship, they still potentially held the balance of power, only not in their own hands. Settling the future of Afro-Americans in the New South inevitably also meant settling the future of white people there, for better or worse. That is, better for some white people and worse for others. That is why my title refers to the Negro question, rather than to any of the common variations on the theme of race or race relations. Negro question or Negro problem has the virtue, as Michael R. West has argued, of setting the predicament of Afro-Americans firmly within, rather than at a tangent from the major questions of political, economic, and social power that were up for settlement in the New South. It also reveals, without euphemism, the illegitimacy of the problem in the context of a democratic polity. Proposing to decide the fate of people occupying the nominal status of citizens, otherwise than with their participation and assent, is a profoundly undemocratic, indeed anti-democratic, undertaking. West argues that race relations as an ideological formation of the problem, popularized with genius by Booker T. Washington, arose precisely as a way to disguise the anti-democratic essence of the problem by providing for it both a definition and a solution apparently capable of bypassing the issue of naked power that lay at its core. From the moment Woodward introduces the Redeemers, discusses their social provenance, and characterizes their political program, he makes clear that the central issue for their regimes was how to forestall democracy. The most common characteristic of Redeemer state constitutions he asserts, was an overweening distrust of legislatures. Quincy Ewing leaps from chattel slavery before ap Appomattox to social, industrial, and civil inferiority after. Woodward, however, does not forget that Reconstruction fell between, although he neither exaggerates its extent nor takes at face value the Redeemer's charges against their predecessors. The radical regime in the average state lasted less than three and a half years. The amount of good or evil the radicals could accomplish was limited by this fact, if by no other. Woodward attributes the intensity of the reaction against democracy to the radicalism of its brief tenure, observing that the investment of freed slaves with citizenship and the franchise was unprecedented. He weighs the varied significance that the legacy of Reconstruction held for different groups of white people, as well as for Afro-Americans. White planters of the Black Belt, for example, gained a greater measure of control over white people in the uplands, in the uplands than they had enjoyed under slavery, when their prerogative of casting ballots on behalf of voteless Afro-Americans was three-fifths instead of five-fifths. For Af for Afro-Americans, Reconstruction kindled a hope whose loss Woodward evokes movingly 
if briefly by drawing attention to the somber coincidence that took Frederick Douglass off the stage in the same year that Booker T. Washington emerged onto it. The intricacies of fusion, that odd policy of forming tactical political unions with the lesser enemy against the greater, are a sufficient reminder that nothing to do with politics among white Southerners was separate from, Af from Afro-Southerners and vice versa. That is especially true of disenfranchisement, which, as, Wo as Woodward makes clear, rested on an old struggle between predominantly white counties and predominantly black counties. The Reconstruction Constitutions, sponsored by, by Republican regimes, confident about controlling the votes of the newly enfranchised former slaves, heightened the struggle by upsetting antebellum arrangements that had limited the power of planters in the Black Belt over the white majority counties. Some scholars may be tempted to attribute all the fuss and feathers to the working out of something they call white racial identities. But white residents in white majority counties were not naive enough to make the same mistake. A populist newspaper in Louisiana roundly charged the Democrats with maintaining white supremacy with the Negro votes. A white county delegate at Virginia's disenfran or disfranchising convention scornfully rejected complaints by Black Belt delegates of Negro domination in their home counties and not from solicitude for the rights of Afro-American voters. I ask you gentlemen of the Black Belt, how do you happen to be here if the Negroes control down there? As Woodward makes clear, the question was not white supremacy, but which whites should be supreme. White residents in the white majority counties of Mississippi sought disfranchisement in 1890, according to Woodward, to overthrow their domination by white people in the black counties. In the end, they suffered the same fate as the Afro-Americans at whose dis disfranchisement they had connived. The Mississippi plan stripped the franchise from the Afro-American majority and lodged with a minority of white people control over the rest. In the face of the resulting hostility, the convention decided against submitting the new state constitution for ratification by the electorate. Disfranchisement not only directly robbed Afro-American as well as white voters of the franchise, but according to Woodward, it also prepared the way for the apathy that steadily reduced electoral participation, a trend that has continued up to the present. It is not done, however, to interpret these matters as issues of democracy and its abrogation, particularly not where Afro-Americans are concerned. The rubric of the hour is race. Though discredited by reputable biologists and geneticists, race has enjoyed a renaissance among historians, sociologists, and literary scholars. They find the concept attractive, or in any case, hard to dispense with, and have therefore striven mightily, though in vain, to find a basis for it in something other than racism. The most recent pedigree papers trace it to culture or identity, at the same time implicating its victims as agents of its imposition. Race as an embodied category of difference and a constructed aspect of identity is not imposed by one group upon another, the author of a recent book insists. It is a product of an ongoing dialogue. The effort to redefine race as culture or identity is bound to come a cropper just as did the effort to define race as biology. Indeed, it already has come a cropper. Though the fashionable preference for complicating analysis may conceal from the unwary the difference between complexity and muddle, race as culture is only biological race in polite language. No one can seriously postulate cultural homogeneity among those whose racial homogeneity scholars nonetheless take for granted. The only veil hiding the conjurer's apparatus from full view of the spectators is the quicksilver propensity of culture to change meaning from one clause to the next. Now denoting something essential, now something acquired, now something bounded, now something without boundaries, now something experienced, now something ascribed. Scholars are quick to assimilate the commonplace that race is socially constructed, 
which a German Shepherd dog or even an intelligent golden, retrie golden retriever knows without instruction, to the popular but mistaken view that race is equivalent to identity. For example, Jane Daly offers as proof that racial identity in Virginia was neither static nor superficial. A Virginian ex read readjusters demand to know how many white men in Lynchburg will go back on their race and make Negroes of themselves by voting for the Mahon Mahonite readjusters. But of course the remark proves nothing about racial identity, not even that there is such a thing. No white politician could have suggested, even metaphorically, that black people who allied with the opposing faction, or for that matter, who allied with his own faction, thereby turned themselves into white men. Whereas white men might make Negroes of themselves by improper or undignified conduct, a black man could make a white man of himself only by an act of misrepresentation or concealment that, if discovered, could under the right circumstances land him in jail or at the end of a rope dangling over a bonfire. Race as identity breaks down on the irreducible fact that any sense of self intrinsic to persons of African descent is subject to peremptory nullification by forcible extrinsic identification. Such nullification occurs when police officers shoot an unarmed black civilian, or even more flagrantly, when they shoot a black fellow officer. Their identification of him as a black man, and ipso facto a candidate for summary execution, lethally overriding his self-definition as a policeman. Whatever Afro-American people's identity may be, and a well-argued recent article proposes doing away with the concept altogether, it cannot be equated with their race. After years of probing them for something of value or use, W.E. Dubois repudiated all efforts to define race as a characteristic or attribute of its victims, whether the definition hinged on biology, culture, or identity, supposing identity to mean an individual's or group's sense of self. The black man is not someone of a special is not someone of a specified ancestry or culture, he decided, and certainly not someone who so identifies himself. A black man is a person who must ride Jim Crow in Georgia. Forced to ride Jim Crow is the key, not identity as sense of self, but identification by others, peremptory and binding, figuring even in well-meant efforts to, to undo the crimes of racism. The victim's intangible race, rather than the perpetrator's tangible racism, becomes the center of attention. Thus, racist profiling goes by the misnomer racial profiling, and the usual remedy proposed for it is to collect information about what else the victim's race. Like a criminal suspect required to confess guilt before receiving probation, or a drunk required to intone, I am an alcoholic, as a prerequisite to obtaining help, persons of African descent must accept race, the badge that racism assigns them, to earn remission of the attendant penalties. Not justice or equality, but racial justice or racial equality must be their portion. In Ben Tillman's world, writes Stephen Kantrowitz, racial equality was an oxymoron. In mine too, I must confess, except that I would replace oxymoron with contradiction in terms. An oxymoron is a figure of speech. Racial equality and racial justice are not figures of speech. They are public frauds, political acts with political consequences. Just as a half truth is not a type of truth, but a type of lie. So equality and justice, once modified by racial, become euphemisms for their opposites. Dubois' thumbnail summary, Forced to Ride Jim Crow, represents the end of the odyssey that Woodward chronicles in Origins. Woodward offers an equally laconic summary of the beginning of that odyssey. Much discussion about the Negro's civil rights, his political significance, his social status, and his aspirations can be shortened and simplified by a clear understanding of the economic status assigned him in the new order. The lives of the overwhelming majority of Negroes 
were still circumscribed by the farm and plantation. The same was true of the white people, but the Negroes, with few exceptions, were farmers without land. Farmers without land makes as good a summary of the starting point of Afro-Americans in the New South as Forced to Ride Jim Crow does of their destination. The same passage reminds us why Jim Crow will not do as a method of analysis. It remained for the New South to find a definition of free labor both black and white for the white workers' place in the new order would be vitally conditioned by the place assigned to the free black worker. Note Woodward's use of assigned, emphasizing that an undemocratic settlement where Afro-Americans were concerned necessarily meant undemocratic undemocratic limits on white people. It is perhaps in order at this point to say a few words about Woodward's observation that it took a lot of ritual in Jim Crow to bolster the creed of white supremacy in the bosom of a white man working for a black man's wages. The phrase may seem to echo W.E.B. Dubois's psychological wage, the beloved pet of so-called whiteness studies, and tempts someone to connect Woodward's argument to arguments about white identity. In fact, however, Woodward's remark differs from Dubois both in its substance and in register. While Dubois' remark is declar declaratory, Woodward's is sardonic. It must be remembered, Dubois explains, what the white group of laborers, while they received a low wage, were compensated in part by a sort of public and psychological wage. To Woodward, ritual and Jim Crow is more a symptom of white people's exploitation than a remedy or compensation for it. His point is not that Jim Crow compensated white people for exploitation, but rather that white people suffered plenty of exploitation that needed compensating for. A few pages on in the same chapter, Woodward makes the point explicit. The rituals and laws that exempted the white worker from the penalties of, ca of caste did not exempt him from competition with black labor, nor did they carry assurance that the penalties of black labor might not be extended to white. The propagandists of the New South Order in advertising the famed cheap labor of their region were not meticulous in distinguishing between the color of their wares. Like everything race relations touches, segregation is liable to suffer trivialization on contact typically in the form of the equation of segregation with separation. That equation is what possessed Joel Williamson to refer to the peculiar kind of racial integration that slavery required, and John Anthony Scott in a mirror image fallacy to consider slavery the ultimate segregator. Both are wrong, and for the same reason. Slavery was a system for the extortion of labor, not for the management of race relations, whether by segregation or by integration. Woodward usually resists the confusion. Not always, it was in the successive revisions of strange career under the influence of various sociological nostrums that he was most liable to the error. In origins, at least, Woodward understands segregation to be an act of political power, as well as a constitutional and moral wrong, an act of power that, whatever the popular sentiment behind it, gained its force from the authority of the state. Neglecting the active power aspect accounts for scholars treating the establishment of independent Afro-American churches and the passage of Jim Crow laws as the same phenomenon or as related or similar phenomena. The near totemic significance often attached to the notion of powerless people's agency can lead to the conclusion that initiative in forming independent churches proves agency in bringing about segregation as a legal and political act. It may also lead to a facile dismissal of segregation laws and the timing of their passage as matters of no importance in themselves, a view from which Afro-Americans who actually lived through the era when segregation laws took effect have dissented. To equate segregation with separation, however, and why ever accomplished, is to vacate questions of power and citizenship making a mystery of the New South and equally of the civil rights movement, Freedom Now was a slogan to inspire the sacrifice of livelihood and even of life. Integration Now could scarcely inspire the expenditure of the breath required to shout it. Woodward presents in Origins a relentlessly social structural argument 
He devotes much of his attention to getting a line on the social provenance, political connections, and economic projects and intentions of the ruling class. Letting hitherto unheard voices from the past speak, not in order to pose or answer questions deemed to be of, of moment, but for the pure antiquarian hell of it, is a doubtful enterprise. It did not interest Woodward, and, I must say, on my own account, is strictly an acquired taste. In our own time, when the overwhelming power of capitalist markets and their protagonists over nation-states and their hapless citizens passes virtually without comment or criticism, Woodward's insistence on getting to grips with capitalism may strike a quaint and rather archaic note. In discussing the proselytizing zeal of the industrialist Daniel Augustus Tompkins, Woodward is at some pains to make clear that it is not just industrialism for which Tompkins and his fellows sounded the trumpets, but laissez-faire capitalism, freed of all traditional restraints, together with a new philosophy and way of life and a new scale of values. The moonlight in Magnolia's nostalgia for slavery and the Old South, along with the cult of the lost cause, was part of the new order. According to Woodward, not an echo of the old. The bonnie blue flag, symbol of the Confederacy long before Lee's battle flag usurped that role, is the symbol of nothing to the present generation of Southern men, Henry Watterson said in 1880. He meant white Southern men, that was before otherwise sane people began to believe the legend of a black Confederate phalanx. Only in the 1890s did the Confederacy become an emotional, emotional symbol. Woodward associates the cult of racism with that of archaism, all part of a new order seeking to burnish its claim to antiquity. Lynching and racist violence in many forms turns out to be one of the novel elements of the New South. That Woodward's discussion of lynching is brief is now a commonplace observation. Even in its brevity, it is valuable for its insistence that an overall tendency toward violence in the South provides the essential terms of reference for analyzing lynching and pogroms, and for its recognition that racist violence occurred in the context of the political settlement for which Booker T. Washington's Atlanta Exposition address provided the public ratification. Appropriately, much has been written about lynching since origins. Some of this literature has been worthwhile, answering the questions why, where, who, when, under what circumstances, with whose permission, facilitation or connivance, and with what result. Some of it had added little beyond moral posturing. Some of it has positively darkened counsel. For example, the authors of one study about lynching bend a perceptive observation by John Dollard. Every Negro in the South knows that he is under a kind of sentence of death. He does not know when his turn will come. It may never come, but it may also be at any time. Into a statement about contingency and agency, rather than a statement about living in fear for one's life. The kind of con contingency Dollard identified was tightly circumscribed, to be sure. It was without doubt criminal and terrible in its living and for a time nurturing of white supremacy they argue. But still, it represented an inter indeterminateness pre predicated on and fostering agency. At every stage of a lynching in the making, the authors inform us something could happen to make events unfold differently. Their concluding non sequitur is that we have much better, we had much better attend to the steps along the way rather than the finished process, or still less, the collective and aggregate phenomenon of lynching. The essence of democracy's predicament, it seems, is the tensile strength of the, hair, of the hair from which the sword hangs, rather than the circumstance that a sword is hanging over him by hair in the first place. For all his brevity in dealing with lynching, Woodward never forgets the sword or how it came to be hanging by hair over a man's head. Origins is steeped in the South, full of its flavors and textures. 
Woodward remains alert, nonetheless, to the international context. More important than the direct international comparisons he occasionally makes, for example, in analyzing the credit system, homicide rates, and regional disparities in health is his exploration of foreign investment in the South during a period when the bourgeoisie of England were scouring the earth for places to invest their sur surplus capital. In one of his wonderfully dry satirical passages, he compares the New South natives with those of the European imperialist powers. Such wretchedness as that of white migrants to Arkansas and Texas belonged to those backward peoples whom the leading imperial powers of Western Europe were in those days seeking to develop and to whom was applied by common international usage the curious term natives. The teeming millions of kerchiefed Negroes in the Black Belt, with their happy-go-lucky disposition and the quaint Highlanders of the mountains, with their Eliz Elizabethan flavor, invariably noted, fitted conveniently into the imperialistic pattern of backward natives. But the observant traveler from the Northeast found some difficulty in accounting for other millions of Southerners of approximately the same economic status, who were not Black, who bore English, Scotch, and Irish names, and about whom there was no appreciable Elizabethan flavor. Despite Woodward's deliberate concentration on power and those who wielded it, he does not treat Afro-Americans as passive objects rather than active subjects of history. His comments about Afro-American Protestant denominations, about the Colored Farmers Alliance, and about Afro-Americans Oops. Um, and about Afro-Americans' distaste for fusion in 1894 refute any such accusation, and even the most zealous apostles of agency would have, would have to concede that Woodward credits Booker T. Washington with an ample share. But Origins does not, where Afro-Americans or anyone else are concerned, emphasize the inwardness of people's lives for its own sake. Woodward is much less interested in how Afro-Southerners, or for that matter, Euro-Southerners, made lives for themselves within the cramped space available to them than in how and by whom that space was delimited and what rules governed life within it. Even his treatment of literature, the arts, and the sciences is not a rumination on these matters in, of, or for themselves, but on their relationship to the novel set of social relationships that constituted the New South. The valid observation that much less secondary literature concerning Afro-Americans was available at the time Woodward wrote Origins, and that the book stimulated much of the literature since produced, is not therefore an adequate explanation of why Origins focuses on some questions to the exclusion of others. Even if the large body of scholarship about Afro-Americans in the South that now exists had been available in 1951, Origins would still have emerged as a book about power and its ramifications, rather than a book about the self-activity of the powerless. After all, Woodward made broader use than most of his contemporaries of the secondary literature about Afro-Americans, including that others avoided because it felt sorry, including much that others avoided because it fell on the wrong side of the color line or the line of political acceptability, or both as in the case of Dubois. Furthermore, Woodward has attributed great importance to his acquaintance with J. Saunders Redding during his stint at Georgia Tech and with Langston Hughes and other figures of the Harlem Renaissance during study at Columbia University in 1931-32, as well as to his later close intellectual relationship with John Hope Franklin. His footnotes illustrate the debt he owed to such associations. No doubt, had it been available to him, he would have drawn upon literature such as Peter J. Ratcliffe's study of Afro-American working class political activism in Richmond, Eric Arneson's study of Afro-American dock workers in New Orleans, and James D. Anderson's study about educational philanthropy in Tuskegee. Literature of that kind is more relevant to Woodward's question than the kind in which the self-activity of the exploited and downtrodden is important just because it is self-activity, regardless of its efficacy. Woodward was capable, of course, as are we all, 
of errors of judgment and fact. I have never been convinced, for example, that it, by his analysis of class structure among, among Afro-Americans. Soon after the war, he writes, Negroes began to break up into differentiated social and economic classes that eventually reproduced on a rough scale the stratified white society. And later, one of the most important developments in Negro history was the rise of a whole separate system of society and economic on the other side of the color line. Beginning as a largely undifferentiated class of former slaves, the race was soon sorted out into all the social and economic classes of the white capitalistic society upon which it was modeled. Lacking a bourgeoisie, Afro-American society was at best a truncated facsimile of the white class structure. It cannot have been a true replica given that those at the bottom of Afro-American society did not answer to those at the top, while those at the top answered to white su superiors. I cannot resist closing with a reflection on an issue, language, that I wish Woodward had dealt with, not because it necessarily belongs in origins, but because he could have dealt with it as no one else will ever do. Woodward did not write about language in origins, though his quotations offer a rich sampling of the varied flavors of Southern speech. I wish he had because his, his comparativist instinct and his brisk way with foolishness would have made short work of the reified entity known to true believers as Black English and attributed by them to the powerful surviving influence of an African meta-language. I say African meta language because even the true believers concede that Africans enslaved in North America spoke many different languages. Ever the comparativist, Woodward would have wondered why there is no parallel concept of Black Spanish, Black Portuguese, or Black French, even though classical Yoruba, not just bits and pieces of grammar and vocabulary, survived in religious rituals in Cuba and Brazil well into the 20th century, while Haiti and the Frank Franco-Caribbean developed African-descended Creole languages that are still spoken today. He would have noted the entire absence of a Creole language in the Hispanic Caribbean and its presence in some and absence in other parts of the Anglo-Caribbean. It would not have taken Woodward long to notice that, despite a large influx of migrants whose mother tongue in some form of Jamaican Creole, there is no Black English in Britain. Though typically bi bilingual in English and Creole, second-generation Caribbean Britons speak English in the accent of their class and region, just as white Britons do. For the most part, their children are not even bilingual. They may understand Creole if spoken slowly and may even be able to say a few heavily accented words in it, but most are mon monoglot speakers of a language indistinguishable from that of com comparable white Britons. Having reached that point, Woodward would have found himself on familiar ground, the history of segregation in America. The speech patterns of Afro-Americans do not reflect a stronger survival of African linguistic patterns among Afro-Americans as compared to Anglo-Caribbeans. Instead, they testify to the greater prevalence, strength, and rigidity in the United States as compared to the United Kingdom of segregated schooling residence, and sociability, especially among the working class. That, of course, is where Woodward came in. All the elaborations and internal linguistic analysis that makes so-called Black English seem a product of itself or a reflection of its speaker's identities or a fruitful arena for the exploration of subaltern cultural expression and creativity are secondary, at best to the central point that it is one of the many outcomes of segregation which is to say that it is a result of the power of some people over others, an illustration not of race, let alone racial identity, but of racism. It is black only in the sense that sharecropping or lynching is black, precisely because it is an outcome of Jim Crow. A Jim Crow approach cannot account for it. Woodward's refusal to Jim Crow, Jim Crow, is the great gift that Origins has bestowed on the study of Afro-Southerners, recognizing the centrality of the Negro question, not just for the aspirations of Afro-Southerners, but for those of all Southerners.
Woodward placed the issue in the same zone where the big questions were to be engaged. But time does not invariably bring wisdom, and momentum is not necessarily progress. Whether we will put Woodward's gift to appropriate use and build on it, in our politics, our scholarship, our morals, our manners, remains to be seen.